This whole world is anchored by the Word of God. The entire church is anchored by the Word of God. Every life decision should be anchored by the Word of God. Everything for us centers around the Word of God. It's so important that when everything else is gone, when the earth is gone, your body is gone, when everything is changed, there's one thing that remains the same, it's the Word of God. Heaven and earth passes away. Heaven, as it is right now, passes away. But the Word will never pass away. It is everything to us. It's the first thing, it's the second thing, and it's the last thing. At any, at any turn of life, at any decision, and when any question is raised, when any problem is presented, the first thought should be, what does the Word say? I mean, as soon as anything, it's, Lord, what? Lord, what? Lord, tell me. Lord, it, that's the first question for every, even if it's not a question, that's the first thing we do. What does the Word say? And, and the Word comes in printed form. I mean, this ink, this ink is life-changing. The ink itself, what is printed in ink is life-changing if you get it in your heart. If you make your life decisions on it, the ink is life-changing. The Spirit of God speaking stuff uninked into your spirit is life-changing. It's the word from God. Whatever the situation, you need a word from God. Got it? And you need to hear the word of God and say, okay, that will be done. That's okay. I accept it. I'm not going to argue about it, God. That's it. And when you do that at every turn, at every small aspect of life, big aspect, every facet of your life, when you can start doing that, you'll be a happier Christian, a stronger Christian, a more successful Christian, more loving Christian, more obedient Christian. Everything starts to work when you can say yes to the word very quickly without a lot of rationalization in it. The angel appeared to Mary, said, Mary, you're going to have a baby. She said, uh, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, <clears throat> I don't even know a man. And the angel talked to her a little bit. She said, okay, be it unto me according to your word. Simple as that. Be it unto me according to your word. Jesus told Peter, they've been fishing all night. He said, Peter, why don't you throw your net on the other side and you get some fish. Peter's like, oh, we hadn't caught nothing all night long, but uh, nevertheless, at thy word, I'll throw the net. <laughs> at thy word. thy word. Nevertheless, I know you got all your reasons. I know you got all your thoughts. Nevertheless. I know it don't seem right. I know, I know that everybody else in your life might be saying one thing, but you know what? Nevertheless, at thy word, Lord. At thy word. In the year 2020, I think it behooves the Christians, the pastors, the churches, everybody to still be considering, okay, what does the Lord say? Lord, what would you say? Lord, what would you do? Lord, we're ready. Lord, we're willing. Whatever you say. That's the only way to live any life. I lived 26 years of my life without that. And then all of a sudden I realized, you know what, I ought to just walk with God. I want to walk with Jesus. I, I, want to, I want to please Him, but I also want to succeed. I want to please the Lord, but I also want to see victory. I, I want to see the Word come to pass in my life. I want to see the Word come to pass in other people's lives. I want to see, the, I want to see this truth take over another human being. You know, and that's really the, the main theme of church, organized church not that I'm organizing, Jesus organized his church so that there would be a mechanism to help this truth take somebody over, to help heaven's will uh, uh, be imparted into the next person. And so that's, that's really the theme really should be of every church is we're designed to help the next person get in the kingdom and this truth to take them over so that they partake of the divine nature and then head back out to get the next one and proclaim the glory, the glory of God, proclaim the praises of God, show the love, the joy, the, the glory of all things related to the Holy One. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's why this is an important, uh, essential part or the whole of your life. Amen? 
Your people are part of this whole thing. We're the body of Christ connected for a purpose. And we've, what that means is whatever it takes, whatever it takes, whatever it takes will be our, our new motto. I think I said this a year and a half ago, but we went ahead with a different one for a while. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes. All right. Isaiah 55 here. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, I always like to make note that this was written in the Old Testament. It's a marvelous passage. Uh, and this was before the Holy Spirit came in and lived inside you, and before the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. And so back then... I mean, there was no way you could possibly understand God because you didn't have the spirit. They, did, they weren't born again. They didn't have the capacity for the wisdom of God and the understanding of God. But now we do have that capacity. Now, the truth still remains. His thoughts are still higher than our thoughts. But by faith, we can ascend at least a bit so that we can understand the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's thinking. The Bible says, have the mind of Christ. Verse 10, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So here we got God saying, my word's going to work. My word, just like the rain's going to go down that earth, do what it's supposed to do, cause that seed to come up, so is my word going to be the same way. My word's going to come down from heaven. It's going to go into that ground of your heart, and it's going to fertilize that seed, water that seed, and it's going to cause a miracle. It's going to do exactly what I sent it to do. So you and I have to understand the word of God is absolute will work every time. It is the word of God. Amen. And in that causes a change in us. Now that change needs to be driven or guided by lots of scripture. What does the word cause us to do and be? There's lots of scripture regarding it. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit today uh, on one aspect maybe. Uh, let me mention some names in the Bible. Maybe you know them, maybe you don't. Here's the, the first one, Shaphat, Egal, Palti, Gadiel, Gadai, Amiel, Sethur, Nob, Guel, Shamua. Do y'all remember those names? You know why you don't remember those names? <laughs> he said because they're in Deuteronomy. <laughs> no, uh, they're actually in Numbers. But you don't remember those names because they are forgotten men. They were the 11 spies who did not believe the Lord. Out of the 12 spies that went into the land, these guys came back with the bad report because they didn't simply, simply, simply because they didn't believe the word of God. Simply because they didn't let what they had heard from God change their heart enough to go for it. Simply. And so they're forgotten. They actually died in the wilderness. It went south quick in here, didn't it? We only hear about Joshua and Caleb, right? Uh, really, Joshua wasn't one of the 12 spies, but nonetheless, we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, let me do a review before we... Do. You can start turning to the book of Numbers, chapter 13... And I want to do a review of uh, the, the children of Israel and their journey, okay? So they were captive in Egypt, as you know, when a, when a new Pharaoh arose that didn't know Joseph. So anyway, they were happy to be slaves there for a while, it seemed, uh, you know, 400-something years. Um, then, then God found Moses, said, I'm going to get your people out of here. Um, and Pharaoh didn't want them to go, so there are ten plagues, you know. Uh, then there was... 
they finally got out. They took all the, they plundered the land. You know, they took all the gold and silver. And every man knocked on his neighbor's door. Give me your stuff. Got to go. They're like, why are you taking my stuff? Because I've been working for it for 400 years. So give me, give me your stuff. And so they left and they, it was great and all until they ran into the Red Sea. There was fear and, then there was fear and crying at the Red Sea. Uh, why have you done this? We're kind of scared. Then there was a miracle cloud and fire to help them navigate. They crossed the sea. Then there was a lot of complaining to Moses about food and such uh, and toilet paper. I mean, uh, and there was complaining to God about food and, and how we used to eat the cucumbers and we used to eat all the stuff and the, the garlic and the onions. And, you know, where's our where's our lavish stuff that they let us have sometimes as slaves? And uh, so so they finally they finally get out there in the wilderness and they get the miracle manna. Miracle manna, you know, it tasted like uh, wafers with honey, you know. You don't know, but that's what the Bible says. Um, and uh, then they got the quails eventually. But anyway, three months into their journey out into the wilderness is when God called Moses up to the mountain and said, I'm going give to you, give you something. So don't let anybody come but you because they'll die. I'm going to bring you up to the mountain. So he went up there. He got the Ten Commandments on the tablets. Uh, that was the first set of tablets. First set of the Ten Commandments was given. And then um, he gave him the tabernacle blueprint. And while he's up there, though, the children of Israel got tired of waiting 40 days. And so they, you know, decided, you know, we need a leader, so let's make it out of gold. And so they collected all the jewelry, all the gold that they had from the Egyptians. They threw it in the fire. Uh, and Aaron said, well, we threw all the stuff in the fire and out popped a golden calf. <laughs> like it was supernatural. No, no, that's not what happened. But anyway... So they, they built the golden calf. God sees it. God's not happy. Moses comes down the mountain. He hears stuff going on that doesn't sound like victory. He said, it sounds like singing. And so he had all this partying going on down there. He comes down. He said, what in the world happened? Aaron said, well, you know, they, they wanted a God. You were taking too long. So we threw the stuff in. Out popped a calf. And uh, that was a, we don't ever talk about the next part, which is Moses said, <laughs> Moses in dealing with God said, hey, uh, get the, if whoever's for God, come over here with me. Whoever's not, you stay there. The sons of Levi came. Only the sons of Levi came over. And so he told the, the tribe of Levi, he said, now you go kill your brothers. He sent them in with swords to kill and they killed 3,000 of their brothers. Now we don't do that today. Aren't you glad? I said, aren't you glad? But there had to be penalty. Before the blood of Jesus, there had to be swift, swift penalty for sin and abomination toward the Lord. Okay? Now there's lots of mercy. And again, we thank God for that. But the call still remains, don't be an abomination to the Lord. <clears throat> so Moses is mad. He breaks the Ten Commandments. Did you know the Ten Commandments got broken? Yes. Ten Commandments got broken. And uh, he got another set of tablets later, but he did break the Ten Commandments. Uh, we'll, we'll fast forward a bunch. In the second year of them leaving Egypt, uh, they finally got the call to go take the land. Go to Numbers 13 if you're not there. Numbers 13. They finally got the call from God. And so verse 1, chapter 13, verse 1, Numbers. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the children of Israel. There's his word right there. I'm giving this to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you'll send a man, every one a leader among, among them. You know, God knew ahead of time who had a right heart, who didn't, didn't he? He knew which men were going to be faith people and which one were going to be doubt people. Uh, he, he knows everything, doesn't he? But he made him go through with this. You know, he, he'll, let, he'll let and sometimes cause people to go out into a place where they can see who, what they're made of. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all them who were heads of the children of Israel. These were their names. And here's where you see the names. Shemua and then Shaphat and Caleb and Egal and uh, verse 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And none of, notice that Joshua was not in here. Joshua was uh, waiting for them. So Joshua was the, the first one and maybe the only one that sided with Caleb when they came back. And that's why the New Testament talks about Caleb had a different spirit. 
didn't say Joshua, it said Caleb. Even though Joshua was included, Joshua and Caleb did champion taking the promised land. Um, so God calls one from each tribe to go up this way, verse 17, and go to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell on it are strong or weak, few or many. And then verse 20 says, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. So they did that. They started off kind of in faith. They started off excited. And they started off so excited, they started collecting all the, all the fruits of the land. The clusters of grapes and the uh, palm granites, the figs, verse 23. And then verse 25, they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. And so they're excited about it, except they came back to Moses and Aaron, verse 26, and all the congregation of the children of Israel. They brought back word to them and all the congregation showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told them and said, we went to the land where you sent us, truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong, the cities." are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the, I mean, they, got, they, got, they named them. I mean, they, they, it was important. It was important to name their adversary. And the Canaanites dwell by the Sui and along by the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb actually made it over into the New Testament because of that statement, because he had a different spirit about him. Today, Jesus is looking for faith, somebody to have a different spirit about him. Not a belligerent spirit, not somebody that's just kind of rough and mean, but somebody that is going to side with God with a big smile in the face of adversity. No matter how risky, no matter how hard, no matter how weird it might be to go into a land and take, to go take somebody's land. Now, we don't have to do that today in that way. But, you know, this is ad adversarial type, you know, leading of God. This is, this is how you dent the devil's darkness. There's going to be lots of things in your life for you to fulfill God's will, you're going to have to take bold steps. You and I, the rest of our Christian life, and this is part of the excitement about being a Christian, is to take bold steps in the face of adversity. I mean, there are bold decisions Christians have to make in the face of financial impossibilities. Bold steps that cause people to head out in the will of God regardless of money. Everybody that's left a career, everybody that's left a city, everybody that's done something like that or went into the ministry or, or even started a business, everybody had to do it based on something else besides circumstances. Your Christian life depends on you hearing from God, believing that word you heard from God, reading the Bible to make sure it makes half a sense, and then venturing out to go for it. And then at first adversity, what are you going to do? Tuck tail? Look, wimps don't change the world. Really, they don't. I mean, when circumstances scare you to tuck tail, you are not going to be a world changer. Your family depends on you and I adhering to the Word of God, anchoring to the Word of God, planting on the Word of God, not budging from the Word of God. I mean, if God said it, I'm sticking with it. Now, even in your bold statement, you're also following the Spirit, right? You're also being led by the Spirit. Sometimes the Spirit says, I heard how, how confident you sounded, but I need you to take a couple more steps because... You're not really seeing it in there. It's wonderful to be bold and confident. It's another when you're faking it. And sometimes it's not about you trying to fake it. It's just you're not quite there, so you follow the Spirit. The Spirit has to work with us. This is where many people have misunderstood some things about faith because faith actually does require fresh leading of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes... Uh, there's, there needs to be some delay. People are like, oh, I'm called to do something and I'm going to go do it. 
wait a second, the calling is real, the timing is not. The timing is you got to follow the Holy Spirit. You're not ready for that yet. So you got to take it step by step with the Spirit of God. There are answers and solutions for your life. You read a scripture, you can't just decide how you're going to make it work. There's, a, there's some leading in there. There's some unction from the Holy Spirit. That's a whole other message. But let's not just be belligerent. At the same time, let's be sure the Word of God is settled. <clears throat> Look at verse 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses, said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We're not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land saying the land, through, uh, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants. See, nowadays our, our enemy is not people. You understand that? Our enemy is not people. It's not flesh and blood. We're not at war against flesh and blood. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness. I mean, there's spiritual wickedness that's rampant. There's wicked twisted, evil, demonic stuff that's coming from hell that's destroying people, okay? Destroying the land. That's our enemy. Scaring us, that's our enemy. Verse 33, there we saw the giants and descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight. Okay, when I read something like that, it's like, wait a second, wait a second. I cannot, I can, I can never, I can never, I can never allow myself to feel like a wimp. I can never allow myself to feel lesser than I am. I can never allow any kind of threat, never, to dominate me. You understand? I can never allow any threat whatsoever to dominate me. I'm bigger. If you're a grasshopper in the side of your circumstance, you've already lost. You cannot remain a grasshopper. Grasshopper, grow up to be warrior. No. When you recognize that there's a little grasshopper in you, you have to decide, wait a second, wait a second, something's off here, something's off, wait a second. I'm not going to be afraid of that. I'm not going to be afraid of that. There's lots of fears in our lives that we will have to combat the rest of our lives. But you have to, at every point of confrontation of that fear, you have to make a decision. I mean, listen, financial stuff is a, is a huge, I mean, financial stuff is a huge giant in people's lives. Okay? Every time that giant knocks at your door, every time you spy out the blessing and see a giant and your heart shrinks, every time you're worried, every time you're a little scared, every time you're so uncertain that it's causing you to not sleep well, all of a sudden you have to recognize that's a giant and I'm feeling a little grasshoppery. All of a sudden that's when you say, wait a second, wait a second. I'm well able to overcome this. I will overcome this. God has given me a promise and this threat will die too. Listen, that is the Blinking light to heaven. When heaven sees your heart feel like that or think like that or say like that, when heaven sees that, the blinking light gets heaven's attention and God is on the scene. And that's why miracles start happening with people who've made their decision. We, we, we're trying to impart this that faith many times is simply you making a decision. Decision for what? Well, a decision which is the opposite of being double-minded. Well, I know the Bible says, but, well, I, well, I know that, I know that the, the Bible says, but, but I know that, look, you're double-minded. You might as well forget the Bible. You're not getting nothing. That's what the Bible says, that if you're going to ask, ask in faith, not wavering, for he that waves, wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Don't let that man think he will receive anything from the Lord. So if you're like uncertain, I don't know the Bible says, but I'll just tell you right now, you're not getting nothing from God. You better go the other way. Amen. 
<clears throat> faith is about a decision. So the opposite would be double-minded where you're not so sure. Faith is actually the decision to say, you know what? God's word will work for me. It'll come to pass. I'll overcome. I will simply overcome. God will cause victory. The end will be glorious. That settles it. That's it. Might as well just start uh, writing a song about it because that's what's going to happen in my life. Might as well start singing that song. Might as well start praising God. Might as well start doing something else because that's settled. God never said we wouldn't have giants to face. But he certainly gave us the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome every one of them. He certainly gave us authority over all devils and evils to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Little giant, big giant, unseen giant, seen giant, not even a giant scares people. The possibility that there might be a giant scares people. You better get over that. No grasshopper. No grasshopper syndrome. <clears throat> okay, verse four, uh, chapter 14. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. So crying and weeping, and then verse 2, and all the children of Israel complained against Moses. So crying, weeping, and, and complaining is not allowed in our homes or our hearts or our Christian circles. Crying and weeping and complaining. I mean, they're, they're, and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if only we had died in this wilderness. You know, when circumstances get tough, that's, that's the feeling. It's like, man, just let me die. Thank God we don't live by feelings. <laughs> we don't live by feelings. We live by faith. Look, if you don't decide to live by faith, there'll be tons of times in your life, scores of times when you'd rather die than live. It's just a natural thought. It's like, man, just get me out of here. Jesus, when are you coming? Just get me out of here. You, you, can't, you can't think like that. You can't, you're being a wimp. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. And, and I know, hey, listen, I know that when you're, when circumstances are, are squeezing you, maybe, maybe even just sick, being sick. I mean, being sick, man, just, just knocks you out. Like you don't have any motivation to do anything when you're sick. Not, not even a little. You, 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 certainly, you, don't, you certainly don't want to go to work. You, you, don't, you don't want to do anything really. You don't even really want to read the Bible and say it out loud. Your body is, 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 is killing you. I mean, it's like knocking you out. And I get that. That is one reason to fight. This thing is stopping me. It's another reason to prepare yourself and fight the first problem that comes. The very first moment, oh, no, 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 I'm protecting my productivity. I'm protecting my future. I'm protecting my week. I'm prote I mean, you got to fight these giants. And the first fight for giants is shout. King David showed us how to do it. He shouted at that giant before he slung. The first walled city came down with a shout. Faith brought the walls of Jericho down, but it was executed by a shout. So you're going to have to get verbal. You're going to have to get loud. You're certainly going to have to get louder than the giant. Goliath's yelling and yelling and, and threatening and threatening. And David, he didn't tuck his tail. Hey, guys, what do you think we should do? <laughs> David knew that he better say it back. You know, because I'm sure that there was a little bit of intrepidation. I mean, when the threat comes, it's like. That's when you have to kick in and recognize I have to do something. 
You don't just walk around oblivious. You have to be active in this. If you're going to win the football game, you can't just sit around saying, I'm, better, I'm a better player than you. I'm a better player. I'm a better player than you. No, you have to actually go. How'd you like my three-point stance? <clears throat> Too old to go all the way down the floor. No, I'm just kidding. So they all wept and cried and complained. Um, verse 6, or verse 4, so they said to one, let us select a leader and go back to Egypt. <laughs> We're tired of this Moses fellow and his buddy Aaron. Let's get out of here. Go back to be slaves. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun... And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those that had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land, give, us, give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregations said to stone them with stones. Wonder, they gave a wonderful motivational speak and speech, and it was stonable. Don't, don't ever expect anybody to like your uh, Bible-believing, positive talking during times of crisis. I just tell you all the story about when I, when I had been sick, you know, years ago, had the fever, and uh, you know, Joni's sitting there saying, "How come you don't? Why don't you do something? Why don't you? Why don't you confess some scripture? Why don't you?" I don't want to hear that. I didn't want to stone her with stones, but if she'd have kept it up, I would have. She waited till the time was right, and then she, uh, you know. Just said it one more time. I was like, fine, fine, fine. You know, when you, if you're going to sit down there and make me do it, fine. And when you're not feeling well, that's what's necessary. Somebody in your life needs to sit down with you. And that's one of the weird things about this season is that you can't even get to the sick one. You can't even get to the loved one. It's just a weird thing. If they're in dire straits, it's hard to even get to them. And that's detrimental. And so we've done a lot of stuff on the phone to help, but there's going to be some, uh, if anybody asked, we would come. If anybody called, we would have to show up and deal with it and fight our way in, whatever it takes. But it is a, a real ploy of the devil, man. And we're going to have to make him pay. I've said this before, but we're going to have to make the devil pay double time, seven times, whatever. We're going to have to really do some stuff. I mean, this, hopefully this, this is helping people fine tune their lives. Deep down, I doubt it. But on the outside, I'm saying hopefully. I think there has been some adjustment, so we'll take it. Uh, verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, I understand how they're feeling. It can be so scary and... No, I'm sorry. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I performed among them? Praise the Lord. And then, then Moses talked to him. The Lord was about to destroy everybody. The Lord was about to destroy everybody and turn Moses into another Noah. Like, I'm going to wipe them all out. I'll make a nation out of you. And Moses said, come on, hang in there. Hang in there. We don't want the other nations to, to have a bad testimony about this. Verse 20, then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and these signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers. So even though God made promises to their fathers, 
you have to accept that promise. We have to accept, even though God made promises, you have to receive those promises. Hang on dearly to those promises. Not waver at those promises. The only way to get the blessing is to not waver at the promise. Verse 24, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I'll bring him to the land where, where he went. Hallelujah. And then we'll, we'll, uh, well, I guess we could read the rest a little bit here. Verse 26, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? If you're a complaining congregation, you will be in the category of evil congregation. Nobody's, nobody's complaining, right? Nobody's complaining about anything, right? What would y'all like to complain about today? Anything? That's a good conversation piece for your family. Hello, family. What would y'all like to complain about today? And then somebody who's listening to this message gets to start it and stop it. I have heard the complaints with the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you've spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. <laughs> the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered, according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above. God had, in the beginning of the book of Numbers, he had them number, the children of Israel. <laughs> Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. Now, when it says Joshua, the son of Nun, if you're not reading the Bible, the word Nun is, doesn't mean he didn't have any parents. Joshua, the son of N-U-N, was a name. But your little ones whom, whom you said would be victims, I'll bring in. Oh, that's amazing. They were doing it for the kids. The 11 spies were doing it to save the kids. Your little ones whom you said would be victims, I will bring in. And they shall know the land which you've despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. <laughs> and your son, sub, son shall be shepherd in the wilderness 40 years, shall bear the brunt of your infidelity. Till your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. He likes that word carcass. Till your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out in the land. That's amazing. He sent them to spy the land. They lasted 40 days. They had 40 days to repent. They had 40 days to get in faith. They had 40 days to change their minds. He said, for every day that you didn't, that's a year in the wilderness for you. The Word of God is enough for us. The Word of God is necessary and it's enough. When do we say yes to it? When do we say absolutely to it? When do we take it to fight? When do we fight the devil? When do we kick the devil in the teeth with it? When do we sling the, the stone at the giant and say, that's it, man, this is coming down right now. Take, that means you take one scripture slinging at the devil. What if it didn't work? Well, sling it four more times. David took five stones, probably just in case. The, he knew it was going to work, but just in case it took him a little while. That makes sense to me. Doesn't it make sense to you? Now, some people have tried to make it even more spiritual and say, yeah, he took five stones because Goliath had four brothers. Well, you made that up. The Bible doesn't say that. Okay, so all we can do is really kind of guess why he took the five stones. Doesn't really matter. What does matter is that he slung them. What matters for you and I is that we say a scripture. Maybe it's money. My God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
No, my God will supply this. My God will supply at the end of the month. Don't worry, honey. Don't worry, honey. Don't worry, kids. Not going to spread any fear to the kids because we're confident. No way, no way. God will always come through for us. You just watch and see. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Ought to be a big sentence in the, in the house. No, don't, don't worry. Don't, don't anybody worry. Don't anybody worry. Don't anybody worry. This is the spirit of Caleb. How, how many of us have the spirit of Caleb? The spirit of Caleb is just different. The spirit of Caleb just sees it differently. The spirit of Caleb just doesn't do grasshopper stuff. The spirit of Caleb says, you know what, our God, he delights in us. We'll, we'll get there. He'll take care of it. Don't worry. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4. We'll try to wrap it up soon. Although there's nothing else to do. If you do want to be ministered today, we'll do that. Pray, pray for you. Lay hands if you'd like. Whatever it takes. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, let me quote this one to you. Uh, or I'll just read this. We'll read this. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13 says, We have, have the same spirit of faith. Uh, I'm just trying to tie this to Caleb had a different spirit. Got it? We know it was a spirit of faith because he made it to Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. It says, Since we have the same spirit of faith, According to what was written, it's like, well, what is the spirit of faith? Well, it's the Caleb spirit. It's the spirit that sees it differently and then actually says it differently. It says, the spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. So just a reminder that if you're going to have Caleb spirit, you're going to have to say something. Part of Caleb's spirit is that he believed something and then he said something. We believe and then speak. That's the spirit of faith. The spirit of faith is what causes you to be a little more bold in the way that you talk, confident in the way that you approach things. You understand? Now, you still do it tender and loving and kind and considerate. Uh, you don't have to go blab to everybody, you know, all of your strong faith. That's very immature to go blab to people that really don't want to hear it, you know, how you think. Uh, preach to people, teach people if they're listening, but you don't have to go tell everybody what your internal faith is doing. Uh, when you're asked, you, sim you certainly tell. When, you know, Caleb hung in there until it was his turn to talk. And then he said, wait, let's just go up and do it. We can take it. He didn't talk about how strong he was. He didn't talk about how weak they were. He said, our God will do it. You see, there's a way to, to be a, a wise, mature faith person so that you sound reasonable. Your reasonableness is the fact that I'm with God. I'm, I'm, I'm believing the word of God. And so that's where I stand just so y'all know. <clears throat> so the spirit of faith, Brother Hankins says, will make a tadpole slap a whale. It, it makes you different. And that's why, you know, over in Acts chapter 4, whenever Peter and John got in trouble for disobeying the government, uh, government leaders said, don't preach that name. They went straight to the marketplace and preached that name. They got arrested. And then they got released and they went back to their own company and they all prayed and they said, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak your word, they may speak your word by stretching forth, by signs and wonders, by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And the place was shaken where they were assembled. They, they asked for boldness, Okay. So there's a boldness about the spirit of faith. Grant us some boldness so that we can do some miracles, so that we can change the world here. Right in the face of adversity. Behold their threatenings. I wouldn't say we're threatened by people just right now. Could be some places are being threatened. Some churches are being threatened. Christians are being threatened. Good people are being threatened. It's the time to say, behold, the threatenings, God. I mean, the devil's threatening people. Virus is threatening people. Loss of life is threatening people. Listen, other countries are really in a, in a devastating 
spot right now. I mean, this, this, the repercussion for this three months is, is going to last for years in some countries. The supply chain of the impoverished companies, uh, countries ha has been stopped, interrupted, disrupted, and that's going to cause hunger and starvation for years. Who knows how long? Death. It's a big deal. So we can't just, you know, sit in our little American huts and ignore the fact that this is a big deal. How are we going to solve this? What are we going to do here? What does it take? One of the problems now is that no countries will let Americans in. But now you start seeing some of the preparation of God, how he's had the whole wide world be able to come over here and live, work, and get educated in the things of God. And now nationals can go back to their, their but are we prepared? Are we prepared? And I'm not saying we're the only country that has been able to help, no. I mean, there's, there's strong Christians in every country. The point is, are we ready? You know, I said back in March, you know, we're built for this, but are we? We're ready. I mean, we, now, now is when we can do something. Let's do something holy. Let's do something with power. Let's do something with the name of Jesus. Let's do something with the blood of Christ. Let's do something with God's spirit. Let's, let's be open to being led by the spirit. Are we ready? Or what are we doing? We've got to do something more and different than the world's doing. Who knows how long this thing is going to last? How many of you thought it'd last this long? Not many. Well, what happens if it lasts another eight months? What changes do we make? What, what changes in our heart? What changes in our life? What, what actions do we take? To be honest, where I'm at right now is I'm just taking it day by day following the Lord. I'm just trying to stay in tune in here. And in, in, in here, uh, nothing's changed. In my spirit, just carry on. Carry on. With maybe a little bit more uh, attention, sincerity, discipline, some wisdom. But nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. I mean, you know, after church, I'm going to eat and I'm not going to make my wife cook. And we're, we're, gonna, we're probably going to go to a restaurant and I'm expecting to go eat at a restaurant. For me, that's sometimes about the only public interaction I ever get. I'm going to eat there. There's people there. Maybe there's something I can do there. And so life has to continue. We've got to continue reaching the lost, continue building the church, continue building people. So let's use the time wisely, whatever that means. Whatever we can do, let's use the time wisely. At least we could be planning. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How long have I been preaching? Is it long enough? Okay, we'll read one more passage and then we're done. Uh, Revelation chapter 2. This is one of my motivators. One of our motivators. You know, these, uh, these shocking things that have seemed to, to happen this year. I mean, they're not the only ones. Think about all the tragedies the world has faced, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, right? We're just not used to them. I said, Mr. and Ms. American, we're just not used to them. The world has faced crisis after crisis for year, thousands of years. We're nothing special. We just, we just bought into the fact that we think that civilized, a civilized society can, can never have to deal with hard stuff. Like we can fix every single thing as a people together. Anyway, but this is a motivator here. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 1 says to the angel or the pastor or the messenger of the church at Ephesus. So this is Jesus telling John, write this letter to the church at Ephesus. Now this is a long time ago, but it's still a church under the same rules and authority and dispensation that we are. With the Holy Spirit, 
Christians evangelizing the world, etc., etc. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience. So here Jesus is going to commend this church at Ephesus. I wonder what letter he would write here. As a messenger of the church, I have to wonder these things. I have to realize when I get to heaven, though Jesus might not have sent me a direct letter, I have to know by the Spirit what he's saying. What does he expect of Houston Faith Church? What does he expect of those that we impact? You can take it for yourself. What does he expect of you? What's he saying to you? He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And that you have tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars. (laughs) And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. I got that whole thing underlined. Is that underlined in yours? I even wrote in there, my goal, exclamation point. This is personal to me. Persevere, have patience, and labor for his name's sake. How long do you got to be patient? I don't know, long. How long do you got to be patient? Well, until he comes. You know, it's easy to be patient for a year or five. How about 10 years? How about 10 years before we could build the building? How about 23 years before you could see what you're wanting to see? How about another 20 till he comes? And then during that time that have labored for my name's sake. So what labor are we doing for his name's sake? What labor are you doing for his name's sake? That doesn't mean you have to go start your own 501c3. No, the body of Christ works together. Most 99% of the people are working together. 99% of the people are not starting their own thing. 99% of the people are working together in some way. Labored for my name's sake. And this is why we expect everybody eventually to be serving in church somehow. I mean, the very least you could do is show up on a Sunday and shake a hand and help coordinate something or direct something or help somebody get something or bless somebody or teach somebody or give something to somebody. That's the very least you could do, but that's it for his name's sake. The very least we could do is at least pass a couple tracts out every week, give the gospel to a sinner every week. The very least we could do is just be the best Christian at the office that you possibly can. That, that, that's, that's doing something for his name's sake. And if not become lazy, I mean weary. So that's good. He, the church at Ephesus was doing fairly well. Nevertheless, I have this against you. That you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works, or I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Wow. Here Jesus Christ is acknowledging the good things that the church had done. He said, but I got something against you. Did you know that Jesus sometimes has stuff against us? Oh, my God. Yeah, he's the Lord. He's the judge of the church. He's not judging the sinners. He's judging the church. He's, he's trying to keep order in the church. And so here he's just simply saying, hey, hey y'all, y'all are doing pretty good, hanging in there, doing some good stuff, not being weary. Uh, but I got one thing against you. You left that which was most important. You left your first love. You, remember how you used to love me? You, remember how you used to do anything for me? Remember how you used to, you used to want to be with me? Remember how you used to want to want to learn. Remember how you used to want to help? Remember how you used to be so bold and confident around people? Remember how Christianity was your first and foremost thought? Remember your first love? Remember remember how you used to want to tell others? Remember how you went, when you first got saved, you went to your family, tried to convert them? And they slapped you around and then you forgot? Remember your first love? Your first love. Of course, that would be 
him, but all things related to him. He says, remember your first love and then do, do what? The first works. Remember your first love and do the first works. Or, he says, I'm going to come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I've always felt like the church would have to close if we don't get this straight. That's what he means by that. He'll take out the fact that they were a church. I, I'm obligated to this. I have to make sure we're doing it right. Young follow if you want to. I have to make sure we're doing it right or we'll just get the lampstand gone. What does that mean? That means even if the church did exist, there wouldn't be any spirit there. Even if the church did get to keep their building, there wouldn't be any move of God. There wouldn't be any word of God. There wouldn't be any real, real work going on there. There's churches all over the world like that. Dusty, silent edifices that people go take pictures of. It means nothing. God took the lampstand out. They left the word of God, left their first love, don't do the works, have no resemblance of what's in this Bible. God will let the building stay, people are gone. We're obligated to make sure it doesn't happen here. I want you to, I mean, I, I guarantee when the pastor at Ephesus got this letter, he went to every assembly in that city, whether it was one or ten, and he read it to them. Now listen. Jesus is going to come close our church down if we don't get serious. I like that kind of Christianity. I like this kind of relationship with the Lord Jesus. Let, let him do what he wants to do with us. Let him make us more fervent. Let him scare us to church. Let him vibrate the inside of us with holy fervor. Amen. I mean, really, you know, even before 2020, church attendance has diminished. It's been diminishing for years and years and years. Listen, church attendance uh, used to be pretty, pretty good back in the days before television. I don't have time to go through the whole history. Anyway, people would go to church just for amusement. People would go to church just to be around people because there was nothing else to do. And it was the biggest building in the town. Wasn't that big, but it was still the biggest building in the town. And so everybody went to church, whether they loved God, wanted God, or believed in Jesus or not. They just went to church because that's what the, the community did. And that's why the old timers in the 1700s, 1800s, and early 1900s could go into churches preach uh, one message or preach a week and half the church would get saved, the power of God would rush in, just mighty things would happen because there were so many sinners in every church. But church attendance has dwindled. Now church attendance is really only the people that are seeking God for real. Oh, I pray that's true, God. Oh, God, I pray that's true. <laughs> Just church attending is not good enough for anybody. It's not good enough for Jesus. not good enough for the one person sitting next to you. not good enough for you. We've got to let Jesus make us serious about these things. But I think the recent stat that I read last year was that most people are going to church only, what was it, 1.7 times a year, I mean a month, two times a month, what was it? I can't remember the stat, but it was like one or two times a month is the average church attendance. Well, that's not enough. You can't stay sharp with that. You, you, gotta, be, you gotta be there so that the pastor can make you mad every week. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. Verse six, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans believed that you could like serve God in the spirit and that it didn't matter what you did with your flesh. Like there was two lives you could lead. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
Amen. Closing the book. To him who overcomes, we get it. I'm trusting that we're all overcomers. We're fighting for you. We're fighting for everybody. We're overcoming together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your brother and sister here at Houston Faith Church needs you to fight for them. Not with them. Or not against them. Fight for them. Fight the fight of faith. To walk in love. To forgive. To stick close. To ignore your differences. To not have to be too vocal on your opinions. Unless it's about scripture. I mean, you got to fight to stick together. 